I can tell how excited all of you are to get into this amazing lineup of speakers we have today. To kick us off, I'd like to invite on screen Professor, e Professor Jeffrey Long to speak about his research on Hinduphobia and the working definition of Hinduphobia as it developed through this initiative. Prior to the conference, scholar speakers um, deliberated and created a working definition of Hinduphobia. This working definition provides a helpful framework to understand the myriad of ways in which Hinduphobia is actualized. Jeffrey D. Long is the Carl W. Ziegler Professor of Religion and Philosophy at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania, where he has taught since receiving his doctoral degree from the University of Chicago Divinity School in the year 2000. In the year 2021, Elizabethtown College has given Dr. Long its Ranek Award for Research Excellence. In 2018, he received the Hindu American Foundation's Dharma Seva Award for his ongoing work to promote accurate and culturally sensitive portrayals of Indic traditions in the American education system and popular media. He has spoken in such prestigious venues, such as the University of Chicago, Yale University, Princeton University, as well as the United Nations. He is the author of A Vision for Hinduism, Jainism, and Introduction, The Historical Dictionary of Hinduism, the first and second editions, and Hinduism in America, a convergence of worlds. He has initiated, he is an initiated member of the Vedanta Society established by Swami Vivekananda in 1894 and is an active member in the Hindu community in America. During Jeffrey G's talk, please feel free to type in questions that you would like us to answer during the Q&A following this presentation. Remember our ground rules and make sure your questions are relevant to the topic being discussed. Please welcome Professor Jeffrey Long. Namaste, namaskar, and good morning uh, and uh, good evening or whatever time it is to all of you around the world who are tuning in. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I just want to say how honored and, and grateful I am to be part of this program. Uh, the Hindu community has given me really more than I could ever possibly repay in, in love and acceptance and, and support. And uh, I, if, if I can be of any help at all uh, on this issue of Hindu phobia, uh, I want to uh, contribute whatever I can. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. And uh, so hopefully everyone can see this presentation uh, that, I, uh, that I've put up. Uh, so yes, you can see it. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, Hindu phobia, it's definition, structure, and history. So, uh, we begin with the definition of Hindu phobia that was just mentioned. Uh, this definition was compiled by, uh, several scholars, uh, who were involved in the organization of the conference. So this is not something I can claim as my own. Um, it's just my job to present it uh, to everyone here. Uh, I'll provide a little bit of commentary uh, on it uh, as I read through it, and then I'm going to follow that with uh, some further reflections. So the working definition of Hindu phobia. Hindu phobia is a set of antagonistic, destructive, and derogatory attitudes and behaviors towards Sanatana Dharma, popularly known as Hinduism, and Hindus, that may manifest as prejudice, fear, or hatred. Hindu phobic rhetoric suggests the entirety of Sanatana Dharma uh, equates the, uh, say, sorry, I have to start again, reduces the entirety of Sanatana Dharma to a rigid, oppressive, and regressive tradition. Pro social and reflexive aspects of Hindu traditions are ignored or attributed to outside non Hindu influences. This discourse actively erases and denies the persecution of Hindus, while disproportionately painting Hindus as violent. These stereotypes are used to justify the dissolution, external reformation, and demonization of the range of indigenous Indic knowledge traditions known as Sanatana Dharma. The complete range of Hindu phobic acts extends from microaggressions to genocide. So there's a very wide range of behaviors that are encompassed by this term Hindu phobia. So we're talking about things ranging from, say, bullying on the individual level to genocide. Hindu phobic projects include the destruction and desecration of Hindu sacred spaces, aggressive and forced proselytization of Hindu populations, targeted violence towards Hindu people, community institutions and organizations, and ethnic cleansing and genocide. Some examples of Hindu phobia. 
calling for abetting or normalizing the killing or harming of Hindus as a result of an extremist and illiberal view of religion and history, kidnapping Hindu women and children and acts of forcible marriage and religious conversion, outright denying or accusing Hindus or any people of inventing or exaggerating the persecution of Hindus, including genocide, calling for the destruction and dissolution of Hinduism on the basis of its allegedly inherent irredeemability. Just a quick comment about this last one. Um, we see this uh, when uh, maybe some practice, some aspect of, of uh, Hindu history or tradition uh, is seen in a negative light. Uh, it is uh, basically proposed that this characterizes the entirety of the tradition and that the only way to do away with some particular social evil would be to do away with Hinduism altogether. Accusing those who speak about the persecution of Hindus or Hindu phobia of being agents of violent political agendas and include names like Hindutva, BJP, ITC, IT cell, Hindu nationalist, Hindutva virus, etc. So we're all here today speaking about this. So be prepared. Uh, we might actually, uh, some of us, uh, uh, get these names thrown at us. Maintaining that all inequity in Indian society, including but not limited to sati, caste, misogyny, communal violence, and destruction of places of worship, stem from and are inextricably bound up with Hinduism. Uh, again, quick comment on this one. Um, it's not to deny that there are inequities in Indian society and that all of these things listed don't occur and are not profoundly problematic. It's the equation of these things with Hinduism, that Hinduism necessarily involves these things that is problematic. Using or enacting symbols and actions that evoke historical attacks on Hindu society, iconoclasm, killing cows, conversion, in contemporary discourse to intimidate Hindu people. Making unsubstantiated claims about the political agendas of people who are simply practicing Hinduism. Personal note, I've experienced this one myself. Stating that the Manusmriti is a normative text for all Hindus and exaggerating its role in historical and contemporary Hindu life. Claiming that Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma does not exist as a valid cohesive category of spiritual traditions. I've seen this particular claim used to silence people who want to speak from Hindu perspectives. Conflating diasporic Hindu identity with Indian citizenship, ethnicity, and patriotism. Erasure of colonization, including but not limited to calling Hindus the white people of South Asia. Uh, before I go into some further reflections, uh, because this, this document is still uh, in, uh, in the process of being uh, crafted, and, and in fact, I think one of the purposes of this conference is to get feedback that could help toward it. Uh, one word I think I would want to add to that list is bullying. Uh, just, you know, intimidation was mentioned. Um, in particular, I, I'm, one thing I'm personally aware of is bullying that Hindu children face uh, in the United States very often that's specifically connected to Hinduism or to what they may be learning about Hinduism uh, in their classes. Uh, so this also uh, needs to be, I think, incorporated. So moving on from the definition, now I'm going to get into just my own personal reflections on Hindu phobia. Um, I'm going to talk about the following topics uh, in my time. Uh, what should it be called? Hindu phobia and other phobias or prejudices, distinguishing Hindu phobia from legitimate criticism, the historical roots of Hindu phobia in religious bigotry and racism. I'm actually not going to, I think, have time to go into this fully, but I understand other speakers are going to delve into these uh, very deeply today. And then finally, just some thoughts on how to respond to Hindu phobia. Uh, so, is Hindu phobia the correct term? Uh, some have criticized this term and suggested alternatives such as anti-Hinduism, Hindu dvesha, that is uh, hatred of, Hinduism, of, of Hindus and Hinduism, and so on. The terminology is less important, in my opinion, than the ability to identify and respond to the phenomenon. So to some extent, I think debates about whether the word Hindu phobia is the right word or not may not be entirely productive. Um, I would want to make a case for the term Hindu phobia. However, I also want to say that Again, I, I don't think the term itself is as important as understanding the phenomenon and coping and dealing with the phenomenon. Um, why do I use the term Hindu phobia? Uh, blank phobia, right? Phobia of whatever uh, is already a very familiar usage in our society. I think it's becoming more familiar uh, all the time for describing similar forms of prejudice. 
Islamophobia, xenophobia, homophobia. Uh, there are important exceptions. Um, hatred and prejudice against Jewish people is called anti-Semitism. Hatred and prejudice against Catholics and the Catholic Church is called anti-Catholicism. So, uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily have to call it Hindu phobia, but this is kind of becoming a standard way of, of speaking about some kind of deep-seated, irrational prejudice against a group of people uh, and a belief system and way of life. In response to the very valid point that some critics of the term Hindu phobia have made, that the word phobia denotes a fear, whereas Hindu phobia seems more like a form of hatred, I would argue that fear, and ultimately even, even underlying fear, ignorance, underlies all forms of hatred. And um, any of you who might know anything about my work might know that I'm a Star Wars fan. Um, what does Yoda say? Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to another um, pop culture icon that I'm a fan of. This is Neil Peart from the band Rush uh, from the song Witch Hunt. Ignorance and prejudice and fear walk hand in hand. Uh, uh, lest you think I'm being too lighthearted when talking about such a serious topic and invoking pop culture figures, I'll quote from Swami Vivekananda. Uh, fear comes from the selfish idea of cutting oneself off from the universe. The smaller and the more selfish I make myself, the more is my fear. If a man thinks he is a little nothing, fear will surely come upon him. And the less you think of yourself as an insignificant person, the less fear there will be for you. We have to remember that all of these people who express hatred, behind that hatred, there is some kind of fear. And ultimately, this fear is, is rooted in ignorance and the idea that I am a separate self cut off from the rest of existence. And then we try to fill that void with uh, some kind of sense of identity that we then have clash against other people's identities. And this, this is where Hindu phobia and I think all the phobias ultimately come from. What about other phobias and prejudices? Speaking out against Hindu phobia does not imply that one cares only about prejudice or violence against Sanatana Dharma or Hinduism and Hindus. I can imagine one response that some of us might get uh, after this conference is someone saying, well, what about all the other people who are suffering in the world? Well, yes, uh, speaking out against Hindu phobia is of a piece with speaking out against all forms of prejudice and all violence against others on the basis of their identity. We're drawing attention to this one because most of us here either are Hindus or are close to the Hindu community or allies of the Hindu community. And so we want to draw attention to this. This, this is important. That's not saying the others aren't important. They're all important. One who is opposed to other forms of prejudice will, if intellectually consistent, be opposed to Hindu phobia as well. And I think this is a very important thing to say. Uh, there are some people who sound Hindu phobic, uh, who are often very vocal uh, against uh, other forms of prejudice. And that's a glaring inconsistency. Everyone needs to feel welcome, accepted, uh, safe, and so on. Uh, an opponent of Hindu phobia will also be opposed to all forms of prejudice. If we're, if we're intellectually consistent, if someone says to us, well, what about this problem? What about that problem? Say, yes, of course, absolutely. What did Swami Vivekananda, I quote him a lot, uh, I'm, I'm part of his tradition, uh, sectarianism, bigotry, and its horrible descendant fanaticism have long possessed this beautiful earth. They filled the earth with violence, drenched it often and often with human blood, destroyed civilization, and sent whole nations to despair. Had it not been for these horrible demons, human society would be far more advanced than it is now. So to speak out against Hindu phobia is part of the whole project of speaking out against all forms of sectarianism, bigotry, and fanaticism is part of the project of seeing that human progress actually goes in the direction that it potentially can and does not continue to spiral into violence and mutual destruction. Distinguishing Hindu phobia from legitimate criticism. This is also a response to a criticism we might receive when we point out Hindu phobia. Uh, to stand against Hindu phobia is not to say that Hindus can do no wrong. Uh, I think uh, from what I know uh, of the Hindu community, the Hindu community that I know and love, Hindus are usually the most critical of Hinduism, uh, of Hindus in practice, right? Not of Hinduism necessarily, not of the tradition or its ideals, but of other Hindus. You know, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. There's a rich history of internal critique and reform within Hindu traditions, and also among Hindus, Buddhists, and Jains 
extends uh, that extends back thousands of years. Uh, there uh, was no holding back. If you read the old uh, Sanskrit literature, the Darshana literature, the ancient Indian philosophers really relentlessly uh, went after one another's arguments, things they disagreed with in, in the other uh, other side. Uh, and uh, this, this is a, a vigorous tradition uh, in India. So reflexively accusing all critics of being Hindu phobic is definitely counterproductive. Someone might be uh, just expressing their genuine point of view about something. Uh, Hindu phobic criticism, however, aims to tear down Hinduism, whereas what I would call legitimate criticism is aimed at constructive change. So just to take an example, it's a controversial one, and I, I always worry about using examples because the conversations get sidetracked into the example and not, not into the main point. But a, a big sort of looming uh, issue, I think, in the minds of many is uh, casteism, right? Uh, the prejudice against people based on their jati, based on birth. And uh, there's some criticism of that which is aimed at basically eliminating prejudice. And again, I would say who could disagree with that? Uh, at the same time, you sometimes see this criticism couched in the terms uh, of this prejudice being inherent or essential to Hinduism, which means that the only way to get rid of the prejudice would be to get rid of Hinduism. So you're definitely talking about Hindu phobia there. So there's a, there's a test, uh, I think, uh, if uh, one encounters a criticism of Hindus or Hindu, uh, Hinduism uh, that can help you differentiate whether you're encountering Hindu phobia or whether you're encountering legitimate criticism. If a criticism of Hindus or Hinduism is offered, is there any hypothetical situation in which Hindus might do something short of renouncing Hinduism, ceasing to be Hindu, that would satisfy the critic? That is, someone offers a criticism of Hinduism, and you as a Hindu say, well, what if we did this, right? What if we changed that thing that you are criticizing? If so, right, if, if, if one can offer such a scenario and the critic says, yes, that would be great, then you have a case of legitimate criticism. If not, then this is a case of Hindu phobia. Again, to go back to the caste example, you know, let's say you're Hindu and you have a friend who says, you know, I've, I've learned a little about Hinduism and I, I don't like this caste prejudice that I've learned about. There are people who are treated very horribly. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. Now, suppose your reply to that is, uh, I don't agree with that either. And in fact, I don't think that reflects the highest values of Sanatana Dharma. When, when I read the Bhagavad Gita, when I, when I um, hear and, and study the teachings of Hindu sages, I don't see support for any of that, that kind of uh, bias. I, I see uh, an injunction that we should see the divine in everyone and, and uh, treat all beings with respect. Uh, so if your friend then says, Oh, wonderful. That's good. So Hinduism is more complex than I thought. It's not just all prejudice. There's this whole other side that I was not aware of. Thank you. Right. So that person was offering a legitimate criticism. They were concerned about these things they'd heard about prejudice. If you say what, what I just described, and the person says, oh, you bloody Hindu nationalists, you know, something like that, th then they weren't really sincere, right? They, they were... Uh, uh, really just uh, expressing their dislike for the whole tradition. So again, to stand against Hindu phobia is not to say that Hindus can do no wrong, but according to Hindu phobic discourse, Hindus and Hinduism are always by definition wrong. In fact, that's basically my personal definition of Hindu phobia is a discourse in which whatever problem you're talking about it's basically the fault of Hindus or Hinduism. And uh, if that sounds exaggerated or like a straw man, I've encountered this. I've personally argued with people who took that position. And so it's there. It's out there. Hindu phobia, uh, in terms of its historical roots, I would say has two sources. Um, in fact, this is one of the reasons it's a particularly, I would say, virulent type of phobia. Uh, Hindu phobia is a potent blend of religious bigotry and racism. Either of those can lead to prejudice and persecution you combine them, then you know you you really do have uh, an uphill battle against something that can be very uh, deeply rooted and 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 deeply irrational uh, in the people that you encounter. On the religious side, it rises from fear or hatred of Hindu ideas and practices. So here you would get, for example, 
Uh, and of course, this, this is not a reflection at all on all of Christianity, right? That would be a Christianophobic statement. But there are those Christians or those substreams of Christianity that say that Hinduism is demonic, that the Hindu deities are, are demonic, that we worship Satan and, and things like that, and you know, therefore deeply opposed to you know, anything Hindu. And so that is coming from a religious anxiety. Um, one could more broadly define this as an ideological bigotry, because there are also non-religious or secular expressions of it as well, uh, just as there may be people who believe that Hindus are going to hell and Hinduism is demonic because of their religious belief. Uh, there are also non-religious people who see Hinduism as, again, inherently unjust, inherently uh, you know, violent, and, and so forth. So uh, it's, it's uh, you could say, not just religious bigotry, but generally an ideological stance that if we're talking about Hinduism, we're talking about something deeply problematic and flawed. Because the vast majority of Hindus are of Indian descent, uh, at least 91% of Hindus in America are of uh, Asian Indian descent, um, and globally, 93% uh, or more of Hindus actually live in India. So there's, there's a tendency to frequently identify and conflate being Hindu with being Indian. That's not correct, of course. There are, of course, a lot of Indians who are not Hindu. And there's a few of us Hindus who are not Indian, but who have, are adopters of the tradition, who, who've, who have uh, taken up a, a Hindu path. Um, but a vast majority of Hindus are of Indian descent. So because of that, you have a type of Hindu phobia that is uh, really basically racism. Uh, and uh, this could be seen as a variant of a broader Indophobia. There's another term, another phobia, just a uh, fear and dislike racism against people of, uh, of, of Indian origin. Uh, this frequently does not differentiate between Hindus, Sikhs, or Muslims. And in fact, uh, there have been a number of cases throughout history going back to the early 20th century where Sikhs, for example, were attacked uh, by bigots in the U.S. who were calling them Hindus because they didn't really know the difference. And frankly, they didn't care. Uh, this is something about bigotry, right? It's, it's, not, it's not a rational, informed position. It's, it's a hatred. It's, it's a visceral thing. And it does not differentiate, right? It's the people who are not using their higher, higher faculties when they succumb to bigotry. So uh, it, it, it's basically based on what you look like. And so this, uh, this kind of uh, Hindu phobia is there too, which to my way of thinking, people may disagree, but it suggests uh, a sort of natural uh, alliance that ought to occur, I think, at least in the U.S., amongst the various uh, groups who are of Indian descent, who, who practice various religions, because everyone's getting attacked right, for, in the same way. How do we respond to Hinduphobia? The expressions of Hinduphobia are so varied, ranging from you know, the micro level, microaggressions, something interpersonal, all the way up to the level of genocide, mass murder on the national and international level to, of course, everything in between, that responses to Hinduphobia must be similarly varied. So there's not going to be one, one size fits all response to Hinduphobia, and I'm not going to claim to offer uh, one. Um, I mean, of course, the ultimate solution is, you know, we all become enlightened and get moksha, but <laughs> short of that, uh, there are many different types of, of responses because every situation is going to be different. Every context is going to be different. Responses can range from one-to-one -one engagement between persons. Now, let's say you experience some coldness or some, some aggression from some individual, maybe in the workplace, maybe in school or something. And maybe it's a situation where you can approach that person and say, do you have a problem with me? Is everything okay? What's going on? And I've heard of experiences, I know of experiences where people make that initiative and a, a beautiful friendship evolves where there was bigotry before. Someone just has deep misunderstandings about India or Hinduism that they project onto you. And once they meet you and find out you're a great person, it changes everything. Uh, that's the personal level. Community action. This is some of what I've been involved in off and on uh, through the years uh, where you know, we, you have groups within our local community and also uh, more broadly speaking across the country to address these kinds of issues as they arise. Legal action, of course, is there. And then you have national or even international action. When we're talking about genocide, we're talking at the level of 
a military intervention or uh, getting the United Nations involved in various ways to try to stop uh, this kind of thing from happening. So the responses are greatly varied. I'm now just going to conclude with a few general observations that I think we could apply to a lot of these situations. And uh, I'm thinking here, I'm not really now thinking so much of things like genocide. I'm not thinking, and I'm really not thinking about Indian politics. I'm thinking about mainly my context here in the United States and what Hindus experience in America. First thing, of course, is getting to the roots of Hindu phobia. Hatred, again, is based on fear. And fear is based on ignorance, right? Avidya, as we say in, in Hindu tradition. People in general fear what they do not understand. So that's the wider public. And ideological leaders, uh, religious and otherwise, may fear the inherent persuasiveness and power of Hindu ideals. And this is not something I hear very much in the discourse, uh, either among Hindus or non-Hindus. But you know, if you look over the history of the influence of Hindu thought in America, some of the most brilliant minds uh, have been attracted to this tradition, going back to uh, the 18th and 19th centuries. John Adams, the second president of the United States, was fascinated by Hinduism. Uh, very famously, of course, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Walt Whitman. Then you get into the 20th century, Christopher Isherwood, Aldous Huxley, uh, J.D. Salinger, Houston Smith, uh, Joseph Campbell, brilliant, brilliant minds who saw that uh, th there is an inherent appeal. Uh, one of the things that attracts many people like myself to Hinduism is that uh, we have these sort of two dominant views in the Western world. We have kind of a, let's say, a, a more evangelical kind of Christian perspective on reality. And then you have more kind of an atheistic, materialistic perspective uh, on reality. And many of us find neither of those particularly satisfying. Where do you find a rational and yet spiritually fulfilling approach to existence? I have found it in Vedanta, and I think, it's, I think this is very powerful. And there are historical cases of people who have felt threatened by this. In Swami Vivekananda's time, there were people who uh, really felt the need to discredit him because he was tremendously popular. When Paramahansa Yogananda came into the U.S. in uh, 1920 and, and stayed uh, right until his passing in the, in the 50s, there was a lot of opposition to him because what he was teaching was extremely attractive. So people feel that, oh, we're going we're gonna to lose our, our congregation, right? We're going to lose our customers. So I, I think that is really at the root of a lot of this kind of phobia. It's therefore essential in terms of the wider public to communicate an accurate, properly nuanced understanding of Hindu thought and practice to the wider public through the educational system and media. And we need more Hindus in Hindu studies. Uh, I, I know it's great to, you know, uh, make money and, you know, go into, you know, medicine and IT and so on. And that, that's fantastic. But if the Hindu community surrenders the, the project of creating the narrative of Hinduism to people outside, right, outsources it, then the, the danger is going to be there that what is presented, even if it's not Hindu phobic, it may not resonate or connect with how practicing Hindus experience lived Hinduism. And that voice needs to be there. I'm not saying you have to be Hindu to be in Hindu studies, far from it. I mean, anyone can study something and learn it well and master it and, and present it in an empathetic way. But to be sure, then you really need people who are who are practicing and serious and who can bring that perspective and engage with you know the critical theory and so on that's there. Uh, otherwise, it becomes very, very difficult to um, engage with these kinds of things. I would say getting our own house in order uh, as well is part of the project of responding to Hindu phobia. And there are two parts to this. Part one is social media and communication. I just want to preface this by saying social media in my experience, brings out the worst in everybody. Uh, I, my social media footprint is relatively light. You know, I think I have a handful of Twitter followers. I think I post on Twitter once every three months or so. Um, more active on Facebook, but I'm mostly presenting, you know, personal announcements there. I just read horrible things on social media by everybody. I, I do not think that Hindus are the worst offenders by any stretch of the imagination here. However, uh, even, and in fact, I would say, indeed, especially when Hindu phobic attacks are the most emotionally provocative, personal attacks, threats of violence, and so on. These are not only adharmic, but they're counterproductive. 
right? You, someone accuses a community of being violent and people get angry and respond by threatening violence. Well, you've just kind of proven the point of the person who's attacking you. Taking the high road does not mean doing nothing. Right? I'm not saying, oh, just be nice and, and uh, you know, don't speak back. But it means responding with facts and with dignity, right? You are a representative of Sanatana Dharma in your life, and especially in the United States where most people are not even really aware of this tradition. And so that's a, that's a special responsibility. Also differentiating between Hindu phobia and constructive criticism. These nuances get really lost in social media because you're not seeing the person face to face and, and hearing their tone of voice. And so, you know, sometimes people communicate in ways that are very unfortunate on social media. And even though, you know, responding, uh, in a good way doesn't mean doing nothing. There is a time on social media when we need to know when not to feed the trolls. Uh, I think uh, sometimes there are people who are deliberately provocative and they want the kind of angry response that they get. Uh, I just ignore those people. I mean, they're, they're really, they're there for their own ego. And uh, in fact, I think the block function uh, on sites like Facebook and Twitter, it's a wonderful thing. You have a very peaceful life if you just aren't filling your mind with, with the nonsense that people are putting out there. Part two, getting our own house in order, living up to our own ideals. And I think most Hindus do this, but if we work for the internal reform of Hinduism in practice, where we do see problems, uh, when, we, when we aim to conform to the highest ideals of Sanatana Dharma, this is the inherently right thing to do, but it also blunts the ability of Hindu phobes to criticize Hindus. If Hindu phobes are saying, oh, Hindus are like this, Hindus are like that, and the wider public is saying, well, all the Hindus I know are great people, then that criticism falls flat. So let's all be great people, right? That's what we need to do. And I think most do already, right? This isn't the whole problem, but it's just one thing we can do. Finally, finding allies. There are plenty of right-thinking people who can recognize that Hindu phobia is as harmful to all of humanity as any other prejudice. I believe many of those allies are speaking uh, in the conference today. Opponents of all forms of prejudice need to unite, pointing out and critiquing prejudice against others wherever it occurs and uprooting it from within not only our own communities, but our own consciousness as well. You know, I'm not talking about going around scolding each other. I'm talking about everybody. Hindu and non-Hindu alike, we all need to look within ourselves and say, where are my blind spots? Where am I not seeing the divinity and the inherent dignity of all living beings that Sanatana Dharma teaches and, and changing our own lives accordingly? Uh, finally, we have to have the courage of our convictions. And I'm saying, especially to the college students, don't be intimidated. Be proud of your Dharma. And to paraphrase uh, Swami Vivekananda, Stop not until the goal, that is the goal of a world free from sectarianism, bigotry, and fanaticism is reached. And that is the end of my formal comments. I, I've tried to leave some time for questions and, and discussion. I unfortunately do have to leave the conference uh, about 10 a.m. Uh, because of my teaching schedule, but I'm very, very grateful uh, to have had the opportunity to speak with all of you. So thank you very much. And uh, hand it over now, I think, to the organizers to uh, maybe moderate the discussion. Thank you for that wonderful introduction to that framework for understanding Hindophobia, Professor Long. Now, our, our audience has sent in some amazing questions, and as MC, I'll be asking those questions on behalf of the audience members that have submitted them. So one of the questions is, how is Hindophobia similar to other anti-religious bigotries, and how is it different? And why do you think people are so resistant to accepting the idea that Hindu phobia is legitimate? Is that a form of Hindu phobia um, itself? Is the denial of Hindu phobia a form of Hindu phobia? Excellent questions. I'll answer the second one first because it's easy. Uh, yes, <laughs> the denial of Hindu phobia, I think, is an expression of Hindu phobia. It's, it's what they call gaslighting. I mean, I've experienced Hindu phobia and I didn't even grow up Hindu, right? I'm this white guy from Missouri, uh, but I've been told I'm going to hell. I've been told I'm a bad influence on, on, you know, young people and things like that. Um, when I became chair of my department at, at the college where I teach, uh, um, now this ended up going very, very well, but the, the, it's a church affiliated college. And there were actually people from the church who were concerned that someone who professed Hinduism was becoming uh, the department chair of religious studies. So I had to meet them and uh, 
they actually were all very nice. I mean, the minute they found out I believed in God, they were fine. I mean, that was really all they wanted to know. But, you know, I talked to them about rebirth. I talked to them about Sri Ramakrishna and, you know, all of these things. And they were fine. But there's that, there's that worry. And uh, I kind of move into the first question uh, as well. So, yes, I mean, the denial of Hindu phobia, I think, is a form of Hindu phobia. If you've experienced it and someone is dismissing your experience, that's, uh, that's abusive, actually. Uh, so I, I, I would just dismiss such claims. Uh, do some people get maybe over-enthusiastic about what they think is Hindu phobia? They say, oh, so-and-so is Hindu phobic, and maybe they're not really. Yeah, that happens. But just to deny the whole phenomenon is, is, is crazy. Um, how is Hindu phobia like and not like other religious phobias? I think one of the things that, uh, it, it, I think it's more like other anti-religious phobias than, than not like, uh, because uh, in the case of most religious phobias, the phobia stems from ultimately just religious disagreement. You know, someone just does not agree with a particular worldview. They, they think it's wrong and they think people should think correctly. So they're against uh, that perspective. Um, but then for that to turn into a phobia, there has to be this additional kind of hateful, non-rational element uh, that gets introduced. That's where I think the racism comes in. Um, that's not unique to Hindu phobia. Uh, th there are a, lot of, a lot of Islamophobia in the U.S. is also racially uh, connected. Uh, basically, brown people are sort of all conflated together, and you have this kind of, of phobia. Um, the Jewish community has been, you could say, sort of racialized in a way. Uh, Anti-Semitism is a very, very complex type of of, uh, of phobia and hatred, where you have a, a, what would initially seem to be a religious disagreement. But in Nazi Germany, for example, if a Jewish person would convert to another religion, that would not be sufficient to save their lives. So it was seen as somehow genetic. Uh, so Hindu phobia is a little like that. I, in, in my opinion, Hindu phobia is most akin to anti-Semitism of all the various phobias. Because I think it, it may also be fueled in the U.S., uh, by the fact that Hindus are a relatively successful community, uh, or at least are perceived as such, but I think really are uh, successful. And the Jewish community is perceived and, and, and actually often is the same. So you get resentment. So there's, a, there's I, we have to add a third element. You, you have religious disagreement, racism, and a kind of class resentment going on. And that's very powerful. I mean, that's, if someone wants a scapegoat, you know, those are the ingredients. Thank you for explaining that. There's an amazing question in the Q&A section by Bhavnish Prabhakar. And he asks, how can we emphasize the day-to-day -day Hindu phobia that people face? Because from his experience, most Hindu phobia deniers believe that the problem is purely academic. Right, right. No, and, and I think this requires people who experience it. I mean, unfortunately, so often the burden is on the victim to talk about it, right, to, to expose it. Uh, and in fact, this is something maybe Hindu Students Council would be really good at. And maybe you already do this, but, you know, sessions where people talk about maybe on a fairly regular basis, okay, what did you experience today, this week, this month, uh, and support each other. And uh, by talking about it, people become more aware of it. And, uh, you know, there are all kinds of prejudices that uh, and sensitivities that people have had through the years that people often just weren't aware of. And then once, once people start talking about it, then yes, it, it becomes a real thing. Yeah, a lot of this is happening, I think, in this very rarefied atmosphere of politics and academia, and people think that's all that's going on. Uh, but no, it's not. It's about what Hindus experience every day. And, uh, and I have so many friends, and again, it's that mix of racism. Uh, they've had experiences like uh, in corporate boardrooms or in uh, faculty discussion meetings. Uh, they'll express an idea and people just kind of frown and don't say anything and pass on. And then a white person says the same thing and everyone goes, brilliant idea. Oh, great. You know, that's a form of, you know, that, that's some kind of prejudice going on, right? So uh, these are the kinds of day-to-day -day experiences that in, in the aggregate, make us realize, you know, there's a wider phenomenon and problem here. And there's another amazing question that says, how can Hindus and their allies work with Muslim people and their allies? And that's a very powerful question. It is. It's a great question because that's a very hard nut to crack because these two communities in particular, I mean, there's just been an awful lot of damage done to one another 
uh, especially, I mean, in, in, in the living memory, right? In the last century, you know, partition, uh, you know, there, there are people still carrying both physical and, and, and mental wounds from those experiences. So that is, is very, very, very hard, but it is possible. And uh, I know of other situations, for example, where uh, uh, Israelis and Palestinians, for example, have managed to, uh, uh, there's this very famous kind of summer camp I don't know much about it. I'm, I'm, I'm out on a limb here, but where you get young people from the two communities to just get to know each other and work together and get to know each other, not as members of that identity or community, but just as people and that a lot can be done. I, I think uh, interfaith friendships and personal connections and community organizations that can foster those. I mean, I think this is something that is really going to be best solved at the micro level, not by some great proclamation from, you know, Narendra Modi and, and uh, you, know, um, you know, the prime minister of uh, uh, Imran Khan uh, from, you know, they get together and proclaim something. I don't think that's going to do very much. It might do a little bit, but uh, it's ordinary people getting together and uh, overcoming those barriers and realizing that all the demonization and all the diff horrible things they've heard about the other community are just, they're just either untrue or they're only true of, of a particular segment of people, not the whole community. Thank you so much once again, Jeffrey G, for being part of this groundbreaking event. And thank you for making this possible. For the latest on our YouTube channel, click subscribe and hit the bell icon for alerts on new content. Remember to like, comment, and share our videos. For more about HSC, you can visit the social media handles listed below.